Hello, my friends. Hello, and welcome once again to the consistently disturbing Vaughn Manor, where it's Sunday, and it's the Sunday Penguin. And today, it's a frightening one because we're talking about this volume, The Dreams in the Witch House and Other Weird Stories from H.P. Lovecraft. I like to talk about this Lovecraft fella now and again, and today we're going to be talking about this volume. And I want to talk about this volume for a specific reason. This is the third volume in the Penguin set of H.P. Lovecraft. They have three H.P. Lovecraft volumes, and together they contain just about all of Lovecraft's fiction. They certainly contain all the important stuff. There are only a few other things that aren't included in here, uh, including his collaborations with other authors. And also just some random bits of Lovecraft, which if you're really interested in Lovecraft, you might want to read. So you might want to pick up the complete H.P. Lovecraft's fiction, the complete fiction of Lovecraft. I would always recommend you pick that up if you're interested in everything that he wrote. But the Penguin set has just about everything, and it certainly seems to have everything important. But the way it was published is interesting. So these volumes were published by Penguin starting in 1999 with The Call of Cthulhu and Other Weird Stories. And this was edited by S.T. Joshi, all of the Lovecraft volumes from Penguin are. And S.T. Joshi is the preeminent H.P. Lovecraft scholar. Nobody knows more about H.P. Lovecraft than S.T. Joshi. And he put together this volume for Penguin and like I said, it was important because this is the first time that I'm aware of that H.P. Lovecraft was published by a major classics reprint house with all of the rigorous scholarship that you would expect from any other uh, classic work that would be published in Penguin. You've got the introduction by S.T. Joshi and you've also got notes at the end of this volume and all of these volumes that are great. I mean, the, the notes are wonderful in these volumes. They tell you an awful lot about every single story in the volume. And when S.T. Joshi put this one together, he, he didn't know that Penguin would publish the rest of H.P. Lovecraft's fiction. So when he put this volume together, he tried to make a book that had Love, some of Lovecraft's best stuff and also some of his most representative representative stuff, some different types of stories that he wrote. He wants to make a great introductory volume that would make you want to read more Lovecraft. So the contents were carefully chosen. I believe uh, in the example of Reanimator that's in here, that was Penguin's call. I think Penguin wanted Reanimator to be in here if I'm remembering correctly, because it's such a recognizable story. Not one that S.T. Joshi probably would put in here on his own because it's not really representative of Lovecraft's fiction. It was a work for hire job. That's, that is tremendous fun, Reanimator. But as far as the quality of the writing, probably not up to his other stuff. And it was full of humor and, um, Almost a self-parody by the end of it. Lovecraft had fun with Reanimator, I think. But not one I think that S.T. Joshi would have put in this volume uh, if the contents were all up to him. But he did do an excellent job, and he fulfilled his mission with his volume. It is a great introductory volume of Lovecraft. Highly recommended. And... Tremendously popular. This sold very well. It's just still selling very well. So they came out with a second volume, which was this one. This is the old-timey Penguin 20th Century Classics edition, which, you know, they don't make anymore. So now this is just uh, available as a Black Spine classic. Again, some of Lovecraft's best stories uh, were put in here. So you had two great volumes with some of the greatest stuff that H.P. Lovecraft wrote. Again, at the, at the point this was published, I don't know that Joshi knew that there would be a third volume, but he hoped that there would be, just to put in the rest of his stuff. 
And that's where we come to this. And one of the interesting things about this volume, one of the things I find interesting, is why these particular stories were left for last. So if the first two volumes came out and he wasn't sure, S.T. Joshi wasn't sure if this one would ever be published. Why were these stories left behind till the end? And when you, when you look through the contents of it, it's interesting because you get a really random selection of stories. You get a lot of stories from the beginning of his career and a couple things from later in his career and one or two things from the middle. But it's all stuff that was perhaps not considered as good or maybe not as representative of his work or maybe there was some other reason that these particular stories were left for last. So let's take a look at the contents and explore why they were left for the end. So in the beginning of this volume, we have stories like Polaris, the doom that came to Sarnath, the terrible old man, the tree and the cats of Ulthar. So those are all fantasy stories, some taking place in the dream world of H.P. Lovecraft, uh, others just straight fantasy that were inspired by Lord Dunsany, the famous fantasy writer Lord Dunsany. And H.P. Lovecraft adored Lord Dunsany, so it's no surprise that he wrote a lot of Dunsany-inspired works. But even before he read Dunsany, he, re he wrote a story or two that seemed like it could have been inspired by Dunsany. Lovecraft loved that kind of old-style fantasy that Dunsany wrote. And so you have these short fantasy stories, which are very unusual, and are very different from his horror work. So I'm not surprised that they uh, did not, were not published in those initial volumes. All of them are fascinating and worth reading, though. Then we have From Beyond, a short horror story, which is not Lovecraft's best. It's not among his best. But still, I like, I like From Beyond an awful lot. They made that really cheesy movie called From Beyond, loosely based on this story. The story's, the story's good, I think. I, I like From Beyond. Then we've got The Nameless City. Again, not Lovecraft's best. It has a lot of elements that were later used in At the Mountains of Madness to much greater effect. Uh, but still, it's a, good, it's a good little story, The Nameless City, I think. It's, it's got some good things about it. I like that one. So again, not one of his best. So, left here for last, but still an excellent story. You've got the moon bog, which is not particularly good. The moon bog is not particularly good. So yeah, that's left for here. You have the other gods, which is good. Hypnos, that's an interesting story. You've got the lurking fear. The lurking fear was written for home brew, which was the same cheap magazine that published uh, Reanimator. And it was, it was written to order, just like Reanimator was. And so it's a very pulpy story. And it was one of the stories that made Lovecraft not want to do this sort of thing again. But it was, it's a lot of fun, The Lurking Fear. Again, a gruesome little horror story. Not his best, but still excellent. You definitely want to read it if you're a Lovecraft fan. Uh, then we've got the unnameable. We've got the shunned house. The shunned house is interesting. Kind of a long story uh, for what it's about. Uh, really interesting, really creepy, the shunned house. It's not a haunted house story, but sort of. It's, it, is, it is creepy. It is a creepy story. Then we've got the horror at Red Hook, which I'm not surprised did not appear in those initial volumes. The horror at Red Hook is kind, it's kind of a, one of those stories, I mean, it's not a, it's not very well written. It has some of Lovecraft's racism that 
actually show up in the story. It shows up more in the horror at Red Hook than it does in his other fiction. Probably because it was written around the time of his New York experience when he went to live in New York, which was a bad idea after he got married. And uh, that was his most xenophobic period when Lovecraft went to New York. He did not fit in there at all. And so his xenophobia was at a high point. And a lot of that shows up in this story. And aside from that, it's just not a particularly well-constructed story. It's a bit of a mess, actually. It does, though, have a couple of effective scenes, which almost make up for the nonsense and the rest of the story. So the horror at Red Hook, it's, it's at least an interesting read, particularly if you're interested in Lovecraft, the, the author. Uh, then we've got In the Vault, which is not particularly good. It's just a so-so basic horror story. You've got The Strange High House in the Mist, which is a really good fantasy story. The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, which I talked about last Monday, and was the culmination of his Dunsany fantasy-inspired stories. He had moved past all that stuff by this point, and this was kind of his last word about it. And really a fascinating short novel, The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, which is not like any of the other stuff that he wrote, really. It was kind of unique, a unique, appropriately dreamlike fantasy novel, very episodic. It's a really interesting reading experience. So I'm glad it finally arrived in the Penguin Classics because it deserves to be there. And then we've got The Silver Key, uh, which is another Randolph Carter dream story, which is almost Twilight Zone-esque. It's interesting. Then we've got Through the Gates of the Silver Key that was written along with E. Hoffman Price. So this is a collaboration, but since it's a sequel to the Silver Key, it's in here. It's not particularly good, but it's in here. Then we've got The Dreams in the Witch House, the title story. I think perhaps this was left for last because it's S.T. Joshi doesn't consider it one of H.P. Lovecraft's best. He doesn't consider consider it one of his best major stories. It is a really interesting story though. And the more that I've read it over the years, the more that I appreciate it. it it's pretty ambitious. It tries to take the idea of witchcraft and give it a mathematical and scientific basis, which is an ambitious thing to do. Also, it is one of Lovecraft's creepiest and most gruesome stories. This story, The Dreams in the Witch House, pulls no punches. It's a, it's a really interesting horror story. Uh, and while it might not be one of Lovecraft's best, it's a creepy, it's a creepy horror story. And yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad it's in here. And it certainly deserves uh, to be the title story in this volume. And then finally, and most interestingly, we end up with The Shadow Out of Time, which was a Cthulhu Mythos story. One of the longest Cthulhu Mythos stories and a tremendously important story as far as Lovecraft goes. And it, it's one of his best stories, actually. So it's odd that that wasn't published in one of the initial volumes, one of those, in those first two volumes. Why was it left for this volume? I think there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, for the shadow out of time uh, being in here. First of all, it's not a scary story, particularly. At this point, even more so than at the Mountains of Madness, H.P. Lovecraft presents you some alien monsters that he identifies with. These alien monsters that he talks about in this story are not particularly frightening. And in fact, Lovecraft kind of admires them in a way. And he gives you a very complex, detailed description of their culture and their society. 
And Lovecraft puts a lot of his own philosophy and ideas about what an ideal society should be into these creatures' society, which makes it really interesting, but not particularly scary. It's fascinating. And what it is, really, is a science fiction story. It's a straight-up science fiction story. And even though the way he writes it is the way he writes all of his stories, where it's supposed to be scary, you would think. And he does seem to realize that his main monsters aren't particularly terrifying because he adds something even more scary in the background, something that is only hinted at. But I don't believe that is particularly effective. The interesting thing about this story is that it does give you a sense of awe, a sense of the grandeur of time. It's a well-written story, and as a science fiction story, it's dynamite. So I think that's one of the reasons. Also, it's long. It's a particularly long story. So perhaps it didn't fit in with the other two volumes that came out before this one, but it fits in with this volume particularly well. Because what you get with this is this sort of grab, grab bag of miscellaneous Lovecraft stories that are all very different from each other and kind of show you these different sides of Lovecraft's uh, writing. And so it makes it kind of a fascinating volume to round out the Lovecraft set. Really, really interesting book. It's not just like The Leftovers, really. It kind of is, but it's not. It's, there's some really great stuff in this book. And if you're interested in Lovecraft, yeah, you're going to find some really cool stuff in here. I will shut up now. I've gone on at length. I will see you next time.